Hi, I'm Holly Cummins. I'm a developer in the IBM Garage. We build awesome applications for clients and share cloud native development best practices to really help businesses get the most out of the cloud. What I'm going to talk about today is the ecosystem implications of our favorite platform. Um, by ecosystem, I don't just mean community. I mean the broader ecosystem, the, the planet. And the reason this matters is we have a climate problem. The earth is getting warmer. It's about one degree warmer than it was in the pre-industrial era. And it seems like it's gonna go up at least another degree. And that, that doesn't sound too bad, just a couple of degrees. You think, well, I'll eat more ice cream. But that that few degrees matters. It's it's not just warmer. It's uncomfortably warmer. It's dangerously warmer. It means things like where we grow our food is going to become affected. It means that we're going to start seeing more droughts. We're going to see more floods, particularly in coastal regions. In some coastal regions, it's not going to be a question of floods. It's going to be a question of submersion. They're going to be underwater. We're going to see more extreme weather events, more hurricanes, more fires. So that's bad. And and But it still seems kind of abstract. We did a project um, earlier this year in the IBM Garage with a startup called the Climate Service. And what they do is they quantify climate risks so that businesses can look at their portfolio, look at their investments and see how much trouble they're in. And we moved them onto the Kubernetes platform. And so, of course, we were testing as we went and, and looking to make sure we hadn't messed anything up. And we were looking at the graphs for flood risk for Tokyo in 2030. And we looked at it and it seemed to be showing that there was going to be a one in a century flood almost every year. And we said, oh, look, we've made an error. Let's fix this. And then the person who knew the data looked at what we'd done. And he said, no, actually, that that is the data. The situation in Tokyo in 2030 is that bad. And that's not that far away. So it seems like, you know, we need to we need to do something. But what what do us as, as IT people, what does that have to do with us? Well, our industry really contributes to climate change. If we compare us to aviation, we all know air travel very bad for, for the climate. Aviation is responsible for about two and a half percent of of energy usage each year and which is roughly corresponding to the to the carbon emissions. So if we look at data centers, that's only a small part of the of the overall energy usage of the, the digital ecosystem. And with data centers, depending whose numbers you look at, it's about one or 2%. So it's smaller than air travel, but it's not that much smaller. And in ter if you think, well, what's in those data centers, in, in practical terms, in terms of the usage, most of it is streaming, about half of it is streaming. But if you look at the technology, I don't have the metrics for this, but Kubernetes is becoming really popular. So definitely some of that one or 2% is Kubernetes. If we sort of step back and say, well, what problem are we even trying to solve with Kubernetes? I think where most of us started on our Kubernetes journey is we just wanted to run a container. We had a beautiful container, we wanted to run it, but then we discovered the power of microservices. And so we said, instead of having one container, that's good, but let's have lots of containers, let's connect them together. Once we start doing that, then you need an orchestrator. Kubernetes is a really awesome container orchestrator. But then we got more excited still, and we said, if one cluster is good, I could have my one cluster, and then I could have two clusters, three clusters, and these clusters, they just, they proliferate, and then we end up with a situation that's called cube sprawl. Cube sprawl, as the name implies, is not so good, and it's really a symptom of the fact that instead of the container being the unit of deployment, the cluster is the unit of deployment. It's hard, again, it's hard to find good metrics for cube sprawl, but I looked at the IBM cloud. We have um, a managed Kubernetes service and a managed OpenShift service. And I thought I'd see maybe two clusters per account, 
maybe three, maybe four, that is 21 clusters per account. And I suspect those numbers are distorted by the fact that probably some customers are doing something else completely and they're not even, even using Kubernetes and yet we still have 21 clusters per account. So that's like, it's a lot of clusters. And in order to figure out whether this is okay or not, we need to look at the energy characteristics of Kubernetes. And there's two important concepts here. One is utilization. The other is elasticity. So utilization is how much of a computer we're using. So if we have a huge 64 core computer and we've just got one tiny little Nginx server running on it, that's not so good. One of the reasons mainframes actually have really, really good energy efficiency is because they have phenomenally high an, um, utilization. So then the next thing is elasticity. Elasticity is what allows you to scale your workload up or down in order to take advantage of the computer and improve your utilization. So in a Kubernetes context, we have our cluster, we have an application in the cluster. It's not actually quite that simple because of course we have the control plane as well and that takes some resources. But the application, it's pretty easy to scale up and down. It's got decent elasticity. We can just change the replica count, we can do it manually, or we can have something like horizontal auto scaling. So we can scale up, we can scale it's all good. But the cluster is much less elastic than the application. I think for a while I've been kind of troubled by the elasticity characteristics of Kubernetes clusters. You can turn on the cluster auto scaling, but it it's sort of a, it, 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 it's a bit maybe not doing what you always wanted. It tends to scale up a lot more aggressively than it scales down. And if your aim is to increase utilization, that's not necessarily what you want. There is a lag. So it's maybe it, it doesn't solve everything. And the other the other issue is that even if we have really good scaling on our cluster, either we do it manually or with auto scaling, and we get that high utilization, well, the control plane itself has an overhead. So that means more proportionally more of our cluster is used for the control plane. So that's not not that's not great in terms of efficiency. And it matters because the things running our cluster are real computers. They're they may be virtual computers, but there's actual hardware there. It's not just an abstract thing in the cloud. We hear a lot of talk about serverless and it, how it's it's so great for energy efficiency and it's so elastic. And in a, in a Kubernetes context, that's k-native, and it really does have great elasticity. You can scale it down to zero, but it's still running in that cluster. So unless we fix the elasticity of the cluster, k-native isn't going to help us that much. And so then the question is, well, why does this happen? Why do we have all these underutilized clusters? And it's not that any of us are malicious, you know, that we're Dr. Malice going, ah, I'm going to burn all my company's money and I'm going to destroy the planet as a bonus. You know, it, these things don't happen on purpose. They just happen kind of by accident for a lot of small good reasons. And with Kubernetes, it, we hoped that we'd be able to use namespaces to support really good multi-tenancy. But we all know namespace isolation, it's not enough. There's reasons where you just need your own cluster. One of the biggest reasons, I think, is just that billing and that organizational structure. And what a lot of us find is that our org chart is replicated in our cluster topology. Another reason why we might want our own uh, cluster is performance. Earlier in the year, I had um, a Tecton build and I had Prometheus monitoring and there was some horrible interaction between the two. And so whenever we ran a build, the performance of the whole cluster ground to a halt. That was kind of okay for our team because our team was the only one using the cluster. But if someone else had been using the cluster, I would have been really mad at them taking all my resources and because I wanted them. We see other problems with things like name collisions. Some artifacts like um, CRDs, they can only be scoped at the cluster level. And so then that means that you, you risk collision. Even if thing, we've had this challenge in, in IBM as we've containerized a lot of our middleware. Um, we also see that, you know, even if someone, even if finer grained scoping is available, people don't necessarily remember to use it. And of course, all of that is assuming that we trust the other users in the cluster and that we trust the, the security. And if you've been paying any attention to Ian Coldwater, you know Kubernetes is not secure by default. We need to take some action to protect ourselves. And the most sensible action as a basic action is to isolate prod. So I, I certainly wouldn't recommend not doing that. I would recommend maybe looking at some of the other clusters and seeing if we can get more of those 
consolidated to try and get a bit of more multi-tenancy. So let's say we do that and we've got a cluster and it's got really high utilization. So are, are we winning in climate terms? <laughs> Not necessarily, because it depends what the workload is. Our industry has a really horrible problem with zombie workloads. So this is stuff that's running, but it doesn't have any value. I saw um, one survey, they, they looked at 16,000 servers and they found that a quarter of them we're doing no useful work. And what they speculated had happened was perhaps someone forgot to turn them off. So again, it wasn't malice, it was just carelessness. And I've, I've been there, um, true story. When I was learning Kubernetes, I created a cluster and then I had too much work in progress. So I went off, I did other things. And two months later, I came back to that task and I'd done a fairly high spec cluster. So it was about a thousand pounds a month and it had just been sat there burning electricity and not actually doing anything useful for for two months so slightly awkward conversation because the thing is even if we don't care about the money it's still it's still pollution it's still fossil fuels 80 percent of data center energy is fossil fuels so it's pollution it's climate change so what this means overall is that as if we didn't have enough to worry about in 2020, one of the really big problems we should be worrying about is zombies destroying the planet. So what, what do we do about it? Well, there, there are solutions to zombie workloads. Some of them are manual. Uh, I spent a fairly boring three hours in a meeting with a UK bank and the CIO was trying to figure out where his cloud spend was going. And so we all just sat there going through everything, trying to figure out what it was for. I don't recommend that as an approach. One thing that we try and do instead, a lot of teams mandate that everyone adds tags to a cluster when they create it. So we can try and have some traceability. That's still pretty manual. It still relies on someone tracking down what the tags mean. It still relies on people remembering to put the tags in. And with all of these solutions, because they're so manual, they, they take the cloud and the thing that we really love about the cloud is it's so frictionless. And then you put this sort of cage of governance on it to try and avoid this wild west scenario of, of clusters being created and not deprovisioned. And it, it takes away the joy of the cloud. So I think the best solution really is one where it's easier to do the right thing than not. One easy, surprisingly effective solution. A colleague told me about it. He was working with a bank and they had a really big zombie server problem. So what they did is they implemented a, a system where when you provisioned something, you had to set an expiry date. You could extend it, but it would get auto-deleted. That reduced their usage by half. Just that really simple thing of auto-deleting. And we can do more sophisticated things as well. So we can start using AI and that kind of thing. So we're seeing a lot of innovation in the area of multi-cloud management. We're seeing cool things with traffic monitoring just to look and detect those servers that don't have anybody talking to them. For Kubernetes, I think we sometimes imagine that because it's so easy to provision clusters, it doesn't have that zombie problem. But of course, I, I, I think it's the opposite. It makes it easy to provision the clusters. It doesn't make it necessarily easier to remember to turn them off. And when we make something, we get attached to it and we think we might need it later on. So we don't want to shut our clusters down in case we need them later. GitOps helps a lot with this. And what I mean by GitOps is not... Um, Argo or, or Flux, but just that more general thing of infrastructure as code, because what that gives us is disposable infrastructure. We have a, a cluster, we can throw it out. If we want it back, we can get it back from source control. If we change our mind, we can spin it down again, we can get it back up again. This is also um, great for disaster recovery. So if we have um, I, I persuaded a client not to do multi-zone because with GitOps, even if a single region went out, they could get their cluster back in 20 minutes and that was good enough for their use case. So I kind of wonder if turning off clusters is going to be the new turning off lights and we just automatically do it because we know we can get it back. And more generally, there's, there's a lot of things that aren't perfect, but all of those unsolved problems, they're opportunities to innovate. And so going back to that one or two percent that's the data centers contribute and what we can do about it. If you're a tool creator, just adjusting how you think about your tool to really support that high utilization, to support the multi-tenancy, to support the elasticity, that makes a difference. And if you can have innovations around de-zombification, 
that's awesome as well. And then if you're a user, you need to take advantage of what the tool creators are providing. So you need to be driving that utilization up. You need to be trying to limit your kube sprawl. And wherever you can, you need to be de-zombifying, knowing what you're using and turning it off. Thank you.